start it and then we'll uh we'll pull it up so we'll we'll check it on the front end here make sure it's there should be we'll have it up in front of us and you won't be able to see the laptop um in the live stream which is nice there we go all right there it is you ready to start it it's there are we good yeah we're there oh my god okay oh. welcome back everybody <laughs> episode 98 we um we're bringing back someone we've been wanting to talk to for a long time so about a year and a half ago we had dr meldramon um to talk about some things and it ended up being like a, a wildly popular podcast so we it knew was, it was probably the most interesting podcast. great comments andy and i were reading the comments prior to this um and so we had we wanted it back for round two um if you have any questions we, i don't know how much we'll be able to pay attention nah, to the gonna, comments I'm probably not, not much but if you have some questions throw them in there um otherwise uh, dr meldrum is a professor at idaho state university and um he's really one of the few if not only Ones from an academic level studying these re relict, relict, re relict hominids. Anyway, I don't have the name right. Let's get him up on the screen. Let's talk to him. Sir, first <laughs> off, I, I will say we were reading the comments before this, and there were a lot of very positive comments about your facial hair uh, from the last oh. one that we did. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Um, it, it's it's it, we were just prior to having you on yeah we were reading through the comments and there were a lot of positive comments about you and about um your the conversation work and, and the conversation a lot and, of uh, a lot of people said uh, there was a lot of fans of yours that listened to it and one of the there was consistent comments talking about like wow i've never heard dr meldrum like go into this level of detail and talk this much this much about and he's been topics. on like real tv i know even on real tv too yeah. <laughs> Um, so the first, first thing I kind of wanted to talk about was, uh, so we met last February, I believe was the date. And so let's see, yeah, about a year and a half ago. Has there been anything that's happened in the last year and a half in terms of research or anything you want to share before we kind of dive deeper in any updates? Not specifically because I'm, I'm still kind of on that, uh, rebound uh, in, in some respects, rebound as far as uh, the prospects of, of uh, undertaking some field research, yeah. actually, actually uh, choreographing some kind of field project, um, like involving perhaps environmental DNA. I'm, I've been trying to get in a position where, uh, and it's always difficult uh, when uh, the fall semester begins because no matter how organized you are, how how disciplined you are in in in, in time management skills, it uh, I mean the students just uh, require a lot of attention and the teaching and other service aspects of uh, of a professorship uh, really gobble up the time and uh, fragment the potential blocks of usable time, and so. Um, Unfortunately, that's kind of languished. I, I, I still hope to and intend to revive uh, some plans for undertaking an environmental DNA survey project, collaborating with Dr. Neil Gemmel. Um, we have uh, kind of fallen out of uh, communication with each other since, uh, well, at least very sporadically during the pandemic. New Zealand was really shut down. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not quite sure of the status. So I have been uh, over the summer and then what free time I have been able to uh, wiggle uh, free it has been consumed by a lot of writing projects and commitments for uh, book reviews and, uh, and other uh, editorship responsibilities for the relic hominoid was the term you were using. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> the relic hominoid. Uh, inquiry the journal that i edit and, oh right you know i've really pushed to try to keep that pipeline flush with uh projects and and it it does i mean it it it, it has been and continues to be um we've got a number of things in the wings and we've i've uh, uh undertaken through the reorganization of the editorial board 
um, the inclusion of a representative for citizen science. Oh. So the idea being to cultivate, you know, not not make it exclusively uh, submissions from uh, bona fide academics with credentials and so forth, or or professional credentials uh, that are suitable, but also invite uh, citizen science to uh, researchers to step up to the plate and with coordination with our editorial board, um, craft something that it, uh, merits review and, and publication under that category of citizen science. And so we've got a couple of things um, in the works that I'm excited about that. Um, and uh, hopefully those will be uh, uh, forthcoming, if not this year, early next year. We've, we've got a pretty replete uh, volume for uh, 2022. So um, we average about, oh, between 150, 250 pages manuscript pages and figures. The nice thing about the, the format that we're using, uh, an open access and non-print, is that we don't have page limitations or mm -hmm. um, costs. And uh, and we can include full color, high resolution figures to uh, illustrate the uh, the uh, uh, submissions. And uh, so it's, it's, been, uh, it's been really great. If your viewers don't know that, just Google the Relic Hominoid Inquiry or it's at www.isu.edu slash RHI. So it's easy to find. I'll, I'll put that in the uh, the video description. So you, you brought up something that, oh, hold on, can I ask a dumb question though too? Because I don't know what this is. What When you say environmental DNA, what is that? Oh, environmental DNA is a new methodology that's been developed in order to uh, using kind of a shotgun of universal primers um, a probe a soil sample or a water sample for remnant DNA that has been shed by the various residents of that habitat or ecosystem. Oh. And so um, we, we did a preliminary study of some soil taken from one of the nest sites up in the Olympic Peninsula. And Todd Disatel, who has <laughs> retooled his lab in order to pursue some, some studies of environmental DNA, examining uh, primate communities in various uh, geographic regions um, undertook to examine the sample came up you know with a litany of all the the cast of characters you would expect in a woodland mm -hmm. habitat uh, but the only primate was identified as a human uh -huh. so, well and see and this this raises the question though because i pushed back a little bit and challenged him and i said so how confident you are are you that that is actually human and not um, uh, just a Sasquatch that shares, you know, 99.567% mm -hmm. yeah. of its DNA with us. Because he was looking at a one, one uh, subunit or one, one uh, subset of uh, a mitochondrial gene. And um, he, he thought that the, the, the locus, the site, the gene that he was looking at was was fairly discriminating and pointed out that you know that same sequence could differentiate a human from a neanderthal mm. and i said well yeah all right that's a human and a neanderthal but that's assuming that sasquatch has the same differential mutations uh that um, or or sequence variants that that uh, a neanderthal has and i said i don't think that's at this stage of the game a justified assumption to make one of our one and, and on that same with that same line of thinking, one of our uh, recent submissions to the Relic Hominoid Inquiry, um, recent publications that is, postings, was an article on mitochondrial introgression, and it's a fascinating read, you know, for your for your listeners, it's, because when when we've run into this conundrum of the result being quote human when examining mitochondrial genes. And if I get repetitive of something that we talked about, no, 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 this is the fall. This is all fresh. I have a bunch of questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Keep going. Um, you know, the 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 uh, conclusion, the default position would be, well, it's either contamination of the sample through mishandling mm -hmm. or not mishandling, but yeah. through handling. Right, right. Or it's simply a misidentified human hair is typically what we what we were dealing with. But in this case, it would be fragmentary DNA from uh, the mitochondria in a in a soil sample. Um, but the third possibility that I've raised is that is that which I alluded to that 
are we looking at enough sequence to fully be to have full confidence that we're not missing those rare mm-hmm. distinguishing um, uh, variants that would uh, differentiate us from them? I know have we because I mean, because if we're down at a fraction of one percent, you know, and you only sequence just a few thousand bases, the odds. I mean, these things are not uniformly right. dispersed homogeneously throughout the genome. And so there's that possibility that you just simply miss it because you're you're looking through one little knot hole and there's a much bigger panorama yet to be uh, appreciated. Now, the fourth possibility, and this is what's so fascinating, <coughs> this uh, researcher, and, and you'll have to forgive me because I'm, I'm shooting flat-footed and I've forgotten his name, but he was impressed initially with Dr. Melba Ketchum's uh, <coughs> thesis um, about uh, the possible uh, hybridization or uh, uh, Sasquatch being the, the spawn of a human female and a mm. subhuman male. And, and as a result, the matrilineal lineage of the mitochondria DNA would be strictly human. Mm. And, uh, and so, um, what, but, but, uh, this gentleman, uh, quickly became dissatisfied with the argument that was presented with the data as, as does anyone who seriously, uh, evaluates her her allegations and her assertions and her um, interpretation of the data. But it spawned him to investigate this phenomenon called mitochondrial introgression, where through some rare um, hybridization events that produce a successful viable offspring, which matures to maturation, you can get the um, female, uh, the matrilineal lineage of the in this case, the human matrilineal lineage of mitochondrial DNA established in the uh, colonized, if you will, population, namely the Sasquatch population. And through, you know, the lucky lineage argument that just through happenstance, a particular lineage gains dominance, gains preeminence uh, number-wise, that becomes the typical state of affairs for Sasquatch mitochondrial genes they still have Sasquatch nuclear genes, which were inherited from mm. the Sasquatch male. Um, and, uh, and so phenotypically, they look like a Sasquatch. They're just carrying this little uh, cellular organelle that has its own little strand of DNA, which just happens to be a copy of a human um, mitochondrial genome. But this would explain, one, why why we repeatedly, when because because most uh, cursory analyses of, of a, a tissue sample are, are uh, usually conducted with a single or uh, not even a complete uh, mitochondrial gene, mitochondrial locus, and um, rarely, I mean, only if you're willing to really invest more, much more time and effort and money into the project, would you try to characterize the genomic. Um, nuclear DNA, you know, do it extensively enough to be confident of your your outcome. So it brings to mind some interesting possible <laughs> scenarios, you know, which aren't, uh, you know, I, I, it, it wasn't that Dr. Ketchum's thesis was totally out of the question. It was just the, the particular scenario that she advocated based on a faulty interpretation, I, th- I think, in my opinion, of the data which suggested close affinities to prosimian primates um, from Madagascar, you know, um, and, and a, uh, a human female 15,000 years ago in Northern Europe. I mean, just this, uh, how do you come up with that? But if you have something that has, uh, with all of the anecdotal uh, examples of female abduction, Native American traditional Mm -hmm. stories about women being abducted and impregnated and on rare occasions giving birth to a uh, viable offspring which may or may not have survived to maturity but in those cases where if if an offspring were uh, birthed and abandoned and the female uh, went back or never went back I mean it just just died eventually as a member of the Sasquatch community 
with offspring that stayed with the Sasquatch and, and uh, uh, rose to maturity, it would, like I said before, phenotypically would look like the Sasquatch, but it would have the maternal um, human DNA, which then could potentially become fixed in the population through this introgression. So, yeah, I hope I haven't lost everybody. No, 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 no this I, is a, I have a bunch of questions. We ran now. right into molecular genetics. That was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so, so, sorry. This did you say that they that there had been examples of like there had been examples of this? In, yes, that's the thing. Is is he backs up this this prop, proposed scenario with uh, analogies in the animal kingdom? Uh, you know, mammals and you know, antelope. I can't remember the, all the examples that he provided that are in the literature where this very thing has happened with through through rare hybridization. The, the mitochondria has become introgressed into the uh, colonized population and essentially they're phenotypically quite distinct from one another. They have different nuclear genes, but they share a common mitochondrial sequence that was inherited as a result of these rare hybridization events which then eventually because there i mean there's not rampant hybridization taking right. place mm -hmm. it's just like the neanderthal scenario yeah it always galls me when the popular press and even some of the academics for the sake of publicity and and sensationalism hype the um you know we're all just one big family uh, one happy family and, and, and we are them and they are us type of a thing. Well, all you have to do is st step back and first, first acknowledge, as is stated in the results of these um, genetic studies, that the, that the um, uh, uh, crosses were rare and far between. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first cross that there is evidence of that's distinct enough that it still it, they can date it goes back 165,000 years ago. I mean, that's before, that's even before Neanderthals were really Neanderthals yeah. in classic sense. They were still, you know, uh, something like something between Homo heidelbergensis and, and Neanderthal. The classic Western European Neanderthal had not uh, fully uh, emerged. Anyway, the point is, so, but, but it, it, it always strikes me, despite the fact that these two species, and I'm quite confident they are distinct species, coexisted in Europe for perhaps as much as 40,000 years. And at the end of that time, you still could pick up a Neanderthal skull and a human Homo sapiens skull, and they were distinct and different from one another. Mm -hmm. So something about these creatures was different enough that they weren't considered, uh, you know, uh, good relatives, good in-laws, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and they kept separate. They kept distinct from one another. And we're differentiable for tens of thousands. Of, I mean, think about it. Tens of thousands of years of contact. I mean, look at uh, our own human history with just a few thousand years of colonization and, and displacement of indigenous populations and so forth and so forth. But to have that, that uh, 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 juxtaposition persist for tens of thousands of years. So I, that's what I found so intriguing was the fact that he could cite these examples in the literature of this very same mechanism it was just a matter of transposing it to a, an alternate interpretation of the possible results of uh, you know some of the, the dna evidence even if melba uh, dr ketchum had gotten reliable uh, dna sequence data it could be interpreted in a different way is there is is there a potential way to get around this issue that if you might be picking up Sasquatch DNA, but because of the mitochondrial DNA, it's showing up as human. Is there a way to get around that? Sure. Instead of, instead of sequencing mitochondrial genes when analyzing a sample, go right to the nuclear DNA Okay. and uh, start looking at, and, and uh, at nuclear genes. And uh, I mean, it, you know, it would take um, uh, a dedicated molecular biologist who's willing to uh, or a postdoc or a graduate student and there's the bus. <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> give it to some grad student <laughs> who's going to uh, undertake that would it be and process I, of elimination well i mean the, but you know i know I'm, I'm talking about i don't and i hate i don't want to go down the negative uh, 
rabbit hole again, but uh, uh, but I you know I couldn't in good conscience uh, encourage a student to openly pursue. Oh uh, right, because of the repercussions. Oh, and this is the thing. I mean, even my students who were doing non Bigfoot related projects <laughs> by mere association by their presence in my lab, they were ridiculed. Really? Yeah, we oh, talked yeah. about that I, last time. I, yeah, I kind of remember that. Yeah, that's, that's a shame. Yeah, screw the haters. Like I say, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm tired of getting um, opening up those, that can of worms again and again in conversations. I mean, I think it, it, it's dirty laundry that needs to be aired so that people are aware that uh, that, that takes place. But, um, you know, there's a lot of other positive positive aspects. I mean, I've tried. I've reached out. I'm, I'm friends with Todd Disatil, but it's kind of like you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And and he has, in a way, he, he is not seen as a totally disinterested uh, party because he's participated in things like Bigfoot Bounty. <laughs> so, you know, really raised his credibility. <laughs> his colleagues. Um but you know he he couldn't care less. He does what what uh, what strikes his fancy, which I uh, admire in him as well. But but I have reached out to other labs. You know I've I've kept my fingers on the pulse of the literature of people doing molecular studies um, on great apes in various uh, addressing various questions. And invariably, when I reach out and try to initiate a dialogue, it's like. Ah, you know, we just, they are, because they're, they're on the cutting edge and because they're well-funded, well-staffed mm -hmm. laboratories, they are dependent on renewals. Yeah. Renewals require that they do nothing to besmirch their reputation or credibility and or di distract, even if, even though the result, if a positive result was had would be, I mean, you know, right. or would it? I don't know. Would it would it make the front page of or the cover cover story for Nature or Science? I don't know. I don't know. It might be too uh, too sensational and not uh, not make it. But um, I've you know I've been told repeatedly, yeah, it's interesting. I'd love to do it, but I just can't. I can't afford the risk of uh, not getting a grant renewal. All these people that work in my lab depend on that on that funding, and uh, they won't do anything to distract from it. That's why the prospect of working with Neil is, I mean, he's already sort of tested the waters. He's pushed the boundary by his research into the, uh, using eDNA techniques to look at the waters of Loch Ness. Oh, that's right. We talked about that yeah. uh, last time. Did, did anything yeah. come from that? Well, the, the end result was that of all of their litany of, of in, this time, in this case, aquatic creatures, the one that stood out as distinct and apparently novel was a, a species of eel that had never been recognized before. And so the idea that maybe there's a, a large eel present in the lock that makes an appearance on the surface occasionally and accounts for that serpentine appearance or the, the wake at the top of the water, uh, that, that was taken as a, a real possibility, whether it lays the mystery entirely to rest. There was no eDNA evidence and they did a pretty, I mean, this was a multi-year project and they did samples from uh, multiple sites across the lake at, at, uh, at every possible depth. And, uh, and then, you know, when you do the water eDNA, you filter lots and lots and lots of water. It's not like you just dip down and yeah. hope that your little vial has has a sample in it that they'd filter lots and lots and lots of water and then take all that all that filtrate and then subject that to the probes to see if if uh, you know anything uh, lights up basically and um, an eel that's a possibility but I mean it was as with all methods you have to bear in mind that as with all methods there's potential shortcomings I mean you're only going to get results based on the uh, comprehensiveness of the of the uh, cocktail of probes that you use, you know the the uh, universal primers that have to match up with something that's in the ballpark, uh, and so you know it should be pretty straightforward for sampling soil and, and standing bodies of water and so forth, 
uh, for DNA, potential DNA, fragmentary DNA, because I'm sorry, for Sasquatch fragmentary DNA, because as we just said, it's so similar, it would basically be this almost the same thing as sampling for human. It's just then when you get a human sample, rather than just accepting, oh, well, it's just a human, it should be looked at, I think, very, very systematically and thoroughly for any potential markers, rare, very rare markers that would indicate that, well, no, it's not a human. It's something very, very close to a human. But here are some differences that suggest that it might be a novel species. Because you got to realize, you know, you're, you're, you're sampling fragmentary DNA. This is part of the challenge is that it's not like you get a pristine sample, like taking blood. Uh, it's uh, you're going to have to, you know, the, the, this is why it's a long drawn out process is you, you probe multiple for different fragments and then have to kind of piece those back together. It's like, uh, you know, it's like uh, screening out a jigsaw puzzle <laughs> and then having to reassemble the puzzle before you can continue with the with the analysis how um I, I i used to remember this but how how long does dna actually like last for in the wild like what's your maximum window you could pick this up well it, it certainly it depends on the circumstances uh, temperature <laughs> etc chemistry um the the uh in in anthropological studies the oldest DNA that has been extracted is is about right, right about uh, two hundred thousand years. Oh, nice! Wow. So we were hoping there was a, on one of the documentaries I was involved with. They actually arranged to have an attempt at extracting ancient DNA from a Gigantopithecus tooth, but the youngest age uh, inferred with some confidence for any sample of Gigantopithecus is in excess of 300,000 years. And so uh, they were unsuccessful uh, in getting viable DNA for sequencing analysis. So, but, and those are under ideal circumstances. Yeah. That's inside a tooth, yeah. inside the pulp cavity, embedded in breccia of an alkaline limestone cave deposit. And so it, uh, you know, with a nice cool temperature, pretty, consistent temperature through the ages and uh, and so there's those are the best conditions when you have something that's exposed in uh, in uh, sediment or in in the water column you know it's it's an organic molecule and all sorts of things from sunlight to bacterial action going to uh, have their impacts on it so Hard, but hard ten, like tens of thousands of years, potentially like worst case, maybe. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think so. But I mean, I, we would be hoping, I mean, the, the, the idea would be in doing a DE DNA survey where you're sampling soil from a nest or collecting the snow or soil from beneath a footprint, uh, you know, or sampling a standing body of water where a Sasquatch may have walked or drank dribbled, you know, uh, uh, saliva or urinated or defecated into the water, uh, body of water, there might be then some recent contribution. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking not so much in hoping to get something yeah, 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 in yeah, yeah. range, but in, in <laughs> 10 year range yeah. you know, or less. And so I think that, uh, that would be what we're, where, uh, where would you want, I mean, I know you, you you mentioned a site in the, in the Olympia area, but like where Olympics, Olympics, like where if you had to go, you know, look at this eDNA, where if you had to like throw all your eggs in a few baskets, right? Where would you go? Well, uh, I think areas that that have um, a trace or, uh, or or physical evidence in the form of of footprints, recent footprints, and or um, other things like nests. Uh, would be a good place to start. In other areas where the, there are physical conditions like, you know, a, a standing body of water, a pond or something that has influx but doesn't have a lot of turnover of the water column. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a good point. Where there have been footprints, where there have been sightings. You know, I've talked with Cliff Berrickman and he has some sites in, uh, near his home there in outside of Portland. 
up in the Cascades where uh, there are uh, there are such bodies of water that kind of fit those circumstances, conditions where sightings have occurred or uh, footprints have been found and, um, you know, the, the, the water would seem conducive to setting up a filtration um, approach to uh, collecting samples. So, yeah, I mean, I, it's not like I, I don't think we would just go out and, uh, or, or, or the other prospect that, that I alluded to was, um, which the, the results of that one uh, Yeti documentary where the researcher collected snow from beneath a footprint. It turned out to be bare, I think, was the result. I don't think it was any more uh, titillating than that. But, um, but they were successful in getting DNA from the, from the snow melt. That's, that is cool. That's wild. Underneath the footprint. I, I have people who repeatedly ask me, um, you've got, you know, Dr. Meldrum, you've got uh, original casts in your collection. Have you ever thought of swabbing those for DNA? <laughs> the problem is, again, the issue of contamination. They've yeah, been yeah. handled, passed around, and and uh, you know, yada, 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 ad nauseum. Uh, it would be such a gauntlet to try to sort through the the prospects of, uh, of uh, separating out human samples from possible Sasquatch samples. So if anybody comes upon a convincing set of footprints or even just a very unmistakable clear footprint these days i mean i've been inundated with quite a number of individuals uh, uh, with very uh, possible footprint finds but oftentimes of single imprints which are just ambiguous enough that you know it could be but i would feel a lot more confident if you had a couple more footprints in succession but in any case if if the if the result was or the the uh, condition of this of the sample the specimens of footprints were were compelling and then then the collection of the soil the layer of soil uh, from the contact surface of that footprint would be a, a viable um, a potentially viable source of environmental DNA so yeah this, bring, this, bring, <laughs> yeah. this brings up no this brings up something I you, you kind of talked about like when we when we we need, we need to start collecting this. Well, you you were talking about this concept of <clears throat> citizen science, which I think is really cool, yeah. um, and potentially you know publishing that at the academic level. But that begs the question: like, do you do you constantly have people reaching out to you with what you think are like legitimate things that could be taken at an academic level enough to get into a journal? Uh, well, some they're they're rare. I mean, I, not not in a in a uh, quote, mainstream. Yeah, 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 but publishable. But, but publishable in, for example, the Relic Commonwealth yeah. Inquiry. I don't mean that, I don't mean that, uh, that the standards are diminished. Yeah. Our, our reviewing process is very rigorous. Right, right, right. It involves, you know, um, uh, unbiased and disinterested reviewers. Well, interested, but not, no prior. Yeah. Uh, particular emphasis or interest expressed in in the question of Sasquatch but but when presented with the opportunity to participate in the review process have been very very um, uh, very uh, you know cooperative and supportive and encouraging uh, excited about the prospect so uh, however you know obviously uh, a citizen scientist hasn't the background or training or experience in in you know just simply the writing up of results, let mm -hmm. alone the experimental design, or at least the um, uh, acumen necessarily to to describe what they found. And that's why I, I, I think we'll have kind of like a mentoring system where mm -hmm. a member of the editorial board may be assigned to work with a potential um, submitter in order to help with the editing and the crafting of a manuscript. Um, but it'll go through the review process, but, but the rigor Obviously, I mean, there, there is a different standard because we're trying to encourage the participation and the effort on the part of the citizen science to emulate the scientific method and, and the objectivity and so forth that, that goes with that kind of, a, of an investigation and its write-up. So, yeah, I, will, I, I think it's a, it, it's, it's a real prospect. 
and you asked if I'm inundated, and then yeah, like have you seen anything that's been like really, really good? You, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. what and what there, what was there, what was it? Well, I mean, one one that we had that that really kind of came to uh, the fore before we had actually instigated the citizen science element, and uh, and and you know created in the guide for authors a, a category of citizen science. Uh, the and again, I'm going to be terrible tonight with names. So I'm, I'm, for some reason, I'm just to. But uh, this fellow ha, uh, operates, uh, founded and operates the Bigfoot Mapping Project. Oh, we, and, uh, we follow them. Oh, yeah. He did quite a, an interesting little write up yeah. of the method, the database, <laughs> and so forth. And so we sort of, we, that was published as a technique paper, mm. a methodology paper, to show, to for him to have an opportunity to explain his approach and methodology and, and the results that he was seeing and what inferences could be drawn. And it was, it was a nice uh, summary and, and drew attention to his efforts to, uh, uh, to synthesize uh, quite a number of, of databases. Because most people, you know, they're kind of, they, they go to the Bigfoot Research Organization, BFRO, and BFRO.net. And, and there are a few other databases out there floating around, but none have really been um, systematized uh, to any degree. He put together, I mean, and he's great at making maps as well. He's yeah. the graphic side of it. So he put together a really nice map. I'm, I'm working on a book uh, co-authored with a cultural anthropologist from the University of uh, New Mexico and uh, looking at Bigfoot in the American Southwest based on our interactions with uh, the Navajo Nation and other indigenous peoples of and uh, you know, colonizers, if you want to use that term, <laughs> um, non-indigenous, uh, and uh, and it's really quite fascinating because he was able to draw on on more data than just what what I had seen on the bfro.net, and uh, the uh, I mean the the book has is it's a ethnographic and ecologic approach to the. To the subject matter, and I'm having deja vu. We may have talked about this a little bit last. I don't time. know. No, I don't we think didn't. we did. No. No. Okay. no. So it, uh, it 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 was spawned uh, from a symposium that turned out to be kind of controversial, but because of some real negative uh, press coverage by a ne'er do well, uh, you know, a skank of a. That's not a good term. But <laughs> <laughs> A guy, a reporter, you know, who just, you know, ambulance chaser kind of. Yeah. Reporter. And and a and a uh, uh, an underachieving uh, legislator who uh, took uh, my colleague to task for sponsoring with discretionary funds as the administrator of the University of New Mexico at Gallup. He's by training a cultural anthropologist. Has had a fascination for the. Uh, Yetso, the the Navajo term for the for the hairy guy down there, and uh, he he sponsored this um, symposium, which featured uh, myself and a local investigator. Who that's a story in, in and of itself. And uh, but um, and and he himself spoke about his interaction with its, many of the tribal peoples on the reservation. It was. It was a gate buster. We had to, he had to change the room twice oh. to accommodate the number of people who came out. And I say a good 80% were from the Navajo Nation. Mm -hmm. Oh, South. really? It was a huge turnout by the, and, and expression of support by the Navajo Nation and for, for this effort. And uh, the second day was an open mic uh, talking circle, basically, and for uh, uh, almost five hours. Uh, people would just come up from the audience and share their insight, whether it was a personal anecdote or uh, an insight about the Navajo Nation's tradition about the Yetzo and so forth and so forth. And and it was just fascinating. And so based on that, we decided to uh, uh, examine this more closely. So I've focused on the sort of the uh, biogeographic and ecologic setting. And uh, in so doing, you know, characterize the habitat, the uh, in interesting comparisons with the distribution of black bear in the Southwest and so forth and, and the remarkable congruence. And um, it's just fascinating when you look at 
the potential habitat because most people you say the american southwest and what comes to mind yeah like desert desert yeah rocks desert, yeah you know, red rock and hoodoo yeah and, and uh, mesas and it's all that well there's also a lot of montane forest that that rings the colorado plateau and the plateau itself is rich in carbohydrates in the form of pinyon pine and and uh, juniper berries and uh, <coughs> excuse me uh, and gamble oak and so um when uh, this fellow from Matthew and Bigfoot created, I asked him if he would if it would be too much to ask for him to to give me kind of a close up rendition of a map of the American Southwest, focusing on the Four Corners area and and the adjacent states, and uh, and he did, and boom, I mean the overlay, the comparison with my projected habitat preferences based on the available resources precipitation, forest cover, and, you know, resources and correlation with black bear distribution. Boom. You know, like a 90. Like right on top of each other. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's so dramatic, you know. I mean, it's just, it's beyond sheer coincidence. I mean, you, you just can't, could not uh, come up with this just by, uh, you know, by, by happenstance. I mean, someone would have to be very, very thoughtful and coordinate in this remarkable scheme in order to in order to localize these uh, recorded uh, reported events so, to to those particular habitats so if we, i was showing him we uh bigfoot mapping project on instagram but how how are those tracked like like is it just credible sightings that come in that get added well you know, it, it's just like with the BFRO, the, the, the curators were responsible for uh, doing some vetting, doing some uh, boots on the ground uh, interviews and checking up on the reports and so forth. At this stage, and, and, the, and one, of the, one of my complaints about the, the, the current data set is that it includes so much equivocal uh, bumps in the night and mm -hmm. tree structures mm -hmm. and things that have come to be accepted as signs of Bigfoot activity, but for which there's really no direct demonstration of a, of a, of a causal relationship. And so that's, those are always a bit ephemeral. But the, the thing is, when you get this large, excuse me, of a data set, um, the, the patterns kind of start to float to the surface and the outliers become rather less significant, less numerous. It seems, you know, it really does. And so, sure, I, I, I don't, I couldn't vouch for each and individual dot on that map, but it sure makes a, a remarkably compelling uh, demonstration of, of, of what appears to be a legitimate correlation between habitat and, and experiences that people are, are having. So, I mean, there's still, there's still problems. And even the, the mapping project has, I mean, there's one of the U.S. maps that that does appear to have have uh, reports from every state in the union, even mm -hmm. you know, the middle of Kansas and Nebraska and so forth. And, and uh, you know, there may be very fragmented, isolated areas, but but this is where I, I I advocate, and it's a straw man, but it's it's nevertheless you know kind of a first approximation to um, to uh, you know sort of frame in your your idea. And that is, what is the current distribution of black bear? Mm -hmm. If there have not been, if the habitat is not present to support a population of black bear, and there never has been, what are the odds of a Sasquatch? Now, having said that, there is always the possibility of, a, of an out of place or a, 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 an unusual encounter. Anytime you have a rare and, uh, and um, widely dispersed species, with a very fragmented habitat, there's going to be dispersal events where, say, a young male is no longer, his presence is no longer tolerated in the, in the territory uh, claimed by a dominant male, and he'll be driven out. He'll, he'll be forced to strike out on his own and, and may have to cover some open terrain that is not primary habitat or even typical habitat. <coughs> but, uh, uh, you know, and, and so that rare encounter, um, this was, this came up as far back. I remember when, uh, 
Peter Byrne had all the publicity about the sighting outside of the Dalles, Oregon, uh, which in part supposedly uh, was the impulse for set, setting up the Bigfoot Research Project headquarters in the Dalles. There was other strategic uh, central location, but why, why would he set up on the dry side of the, you know, the, the, the leeward side of the Cascades where you have a sagebrush step instead of the montane forest on the on the uh, windward side, the rain, wet side of the of the range. Well, there was that report that got a lot of attraction uh, and uh, traction and attraction attracted a lot of attention. And uh, you know, Peter was parading around with his tranquilizer gun and <laughs> <laughs> got, got in the newspapers a number of times. And you know, he set up that blind. Well, there was that sighting, and maybe it was legitimate sighting of Sasquatch striking out across the sagebrush steppe, across the desert. Maybe that was a young adult male that had been forced out and was heading across <laughs> the gap to the Blue Mountains in uh, eastern, east central Oregon and up into southeastern Washington, where we know there are lots of reports emanating that are credible, that are sustained, uh, or substantiated rather, by uh, footprint evidence and other photographic evidence and so on. What's... Um... <clears throat> kind of going back about five minutes before because it was kind of interesting to me what do the um, what are the navajos i forget the term that that they it was i forget you mentioned it, it i couldn't remember yeah and, oh, I, and I have to say it fast because i can never pronounce yep. y- yaitso, yaitso. yaitso what so what do they say about about this thing well uh, as with all native traditions there is a certain if, if you want to call it folkloric mm-hmm. yeah 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 here and uh, but when you question them about what these creatures are doing, what occupies their time, you know, uh, in a, in a more fundamental way, they sound just like any other, you know, large omnivorous mammal species. And um, but their their description is essentially that uh, uh, you know it fits. It's consistent with. <clears throat> to the extent that I'm familiar with the anecdotes, it's consistent with other reports elsewhere. And as I pointed out, there's there's lots of habitat uh, up in the, uh, again, I'm caught flat-footed here. No, you, I, I'm also curious to ask, when you, when you talk about, you know, what Native Americans think on this subject, have you found that it's very, like, different Native American... I guess tribes would be the term. They mm-hmm. perceive this very similarly across across the yeah. U.S. Is it is it like conserved? It uh, to a degree, yes. But as you might expect, with so there are common denominators yeah. that certainly um, that certainly are shared across tribal boundaries. But uh, you know everything is viewed through the lens of of their particular life experience and history and so forth. And so there are always you know, slight uh, 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 inflections of uh, perception. So some some perceive it as, uh, you know, this, um, uh, what's the word I'm after, uh, a, uh, a guardian of nature. Mm. You know, it, it appears when, when the tribal peoples have lost the, lost touch with the traditional ways. So when it, when there's a flurry of reports, it's it's a reminder, you know, it kind of represents the human connection to the wilderness and and the harmony that should exist, and so um, it, it is seen as kind of a a portent of things kind of having gone off the rails and we need to get back on track, basically. On the other hand, others see it as a very nefarious. Uh, entity that is cannibalistic and snatches not only children and yeah, women, but that's the one I've heard. Braves. And so, you know, in some areas, the Braves won't go into the woods unless they're in a large hunting party because, uh, and repeatedly, we had a, just recently an experience where we had a native uh, woman uh, speak at the uh, conference convention that was held here in Pocatello a few weeks ago. And uh, she wanted to provide some perspective from the native point of view. And um, 
she made a comment that, that I've heard so many times. She says, we were always taught growing up, we were never to whistle at night. <laughs> oh, really? To track the Sovitsa, see, and that's exactly what, what they say. I had a woman who, a student, was from the Yakima Nation, uh, Yakima or Umatilla, uh, over in southeastern Washington, but she said that very same thing growing up. Uh, they were told never to whistle when they were walking home from from their friend's home. Or at night, they didn't have air conditioning, so they would open the windows up in the summertime, get a good breeze. And the, she said, our grannies would tell us, now, no fussing, no no, you know, horseplay, because uh, the windows open. If you make a lot of noise, you'll attract the Sovitsa, and he'll, or the lost brother was one of the terms, he'll reach in through the window and snap the window. Oh what happened to you? I wonder if that's like a tale of like, you need to go to bed. Right. Like, give these kids to shut up. <laughs> yeah. There's a great, uh, you have to look for it online. Um, the uh, Some of the tribes up in Canada, as so many have, and the Navajo are, are no exception, and one of the reasons they were so forthcoming, is that they they uh, realize that they're they're losing a generation. The, the current generation of young people know more about... Uh, what they know about Bigfoot, they have learned more from cable TV <laughs> than from their elders. Yeah. And so they have been more forthcoming in sharing traditions of all um, aspects of their of their culture, including the uh, Zonaqua and the Bukwas. So up in uh, uh, somewhere, I think it was the Coatl tribe, but uh, in cooperation with the uh, Ministry of Culture in Canada, have been photo archiving some of these traditional um, rituals and dances and so forth. And one of them is the Sonaqua dance. And <clears throat> and as the tribal elder or chief is actually um, introducing it, he says it with this wry little grin and chuckle. He goes, he says, you know, this is kind of a boogeyman story we tell the children to keep them in line. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it serves a dual purpose. Yeah. <laughs> At the, uh, then, then you have this marvelous depiction with this, this mask with the pursed lips and the slit eyes, the droopy, drowsy eyes, because the Tsonaqua, although she's this big, uh, potentially ferocious giant, she's a little bit dim-witted, and she uh, tends to fall asleep quite readily. And she has these big oversized hands that, uh, that she reportedly covers in pine pitch, so she can grab onto the kids and they can't slip away. And oh. she pitches them into her basket, a, a crude wicker basket on her back. And so this is the dance. The drummer's, you know, uh, beating out the rhythm and, and singing. And then out, out dances the Tsonaqua, showing these hands and then scooping up the children and throwing them in her basket. But then she falls asleep. And while she's sleeping, the kids are able to usually escape and get away and come <laughs> home and behave themselves. That would terrify me as a child if I had heard that. Someone's yeah, come no, snatch no, it. no, we we were subject to the to the German nursery rhymes, which were ten times worse. Yeah, than that's, this, yeah that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no. Struble, struble. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cut yeah. off your fingers. Yeah. 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 Cut their hands off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there hasn't, uh, there hasn't been any like, you never heard of any account. I don't, I don't think we oh, talked about this oh, last. Oh, time. Wait, hold on a second though. When is this? When is your next book going to come out? That's then? a good question. Yes. Well, it it keeps getting uh, 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 <clears throat> sidetracked, unfortunately, by by other projects. Mm -hmm. it seems. So, I've actually got a couple of irons in the fire one is uh, and we put a big push two summers ago on the the bigfoot in the american southwest and then um again some of the circumstances in the life of uh, of my co-author uh, he's now uh, residing back east still teaching some some uh, zoom courses on the on campus at, at the uh, university of new mexico but um, so we just got to get our ducks in a row and get the thing finished so, but it always, it always takes a bit of time. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you know, there still is the, the, uh, uh, the, the relic hominoid book. My, my little field guide is actually the abstract, the shrunken head version of what the next book was going to address to, uh, consider the notion of Sasquatch amongst all of the relic potential relic hominoids. 
these other branches of a bushy tree and show the evidence, a lot of emphasis on the footprint evidence and so forth, but the historical <coughs> evidence for the existence of these creatures within a, these species within an, an anthropological context. So that's how it's about two thirds done written. You know, it's just, again, it needs the push. I, I literally got distracted from that project by the prospect of writing the second field book. And it served to be a, uh, you know, a good way to help uh, kind of uh, collect my thinking. Now, um, Doug Hycheck, <coughs> the uh, producer, White Wolf Entertainment, the producer of Sasquatch Legend Meet Science, the documentary, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which was the basis for my first book, he is hoping to launch a documentary miniseries called Sasquatch Legend Meet Science 2 to pick up where the first left off and kind of follow those threads into the next couple of decades and discuss the developments that have occurred, any new findings and new methodologies that might be applied. And of course he said, so Jeff, you know, you know, you have to write the companion volume <laughs> as well as participate in it heavily. So that has been uh, fomenting in, on the side as well. So, like I said, though, once uh, once the fall semester starts, it's really hard to uh, sustain um, uh, an effort to, uh, especially when that available time is punctuated by uh, engrossing experiences like this. <laughs> yeah, we're I know we're well, stealing your time. Yeah, 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 and so forth, which which I take very seriously as as an opportunity for academic outreach. And as you point out, there aren't many. Uh, of of uh, me, my types in academia, to yeah. uh, fulfill that role, uh, because we've lost you know Dr. Bindernagel and and other academics who in retirement had expressed intentions to turn their attention you know clear back from Leroy Fish and Darius Swindler and and so on and no sooner are they freed up from their their academic obligations than unfortunately their health. Uh, they they departed as a result of bad health. So, I was, it, yeah, I was. The lesson is I can't retire. Yeah, yes. right. No, no, you're I stuck. was gonna. One of my questions, and we're not gonna get to all my questions, but one of my questions was, yeah, what other who, what other people, other academic resources would you suggest? Like, if people listening, if they want to, like, are there other people they could Google like yourself? I know there's very few, but are there like uh, some collaborators or anyone like that? Well, there are collaborators, but they're not in a position to openly pursue their interests mm -hmm. and, and, you know, do research and um, do, uh, you know, attempt to publish. And, um, but I, I interact and that, that's been one of the real um, perks, the one, real benefits of the uh, establishment some 12, almost 13 years ago now of the Relic Hominoid Inquiry. Mm -hmm. It gives me an opportunity to interact with lots of people behind the scenes. When, like, for, when I send, a, when I receive a submission, a manuscript submission, and I'm looking for reviewers, I don't send it to some. You know, I, I have some other uh, member of the editorial board usually assist me uh, and and read it as well. But when we send it out for external review, we don't send it to just some short list of yeah. viewers. I, I, whatever the topic is, whether it's bioacoustics or molecular or whatever, I look for the people, the movers and shakers that are publishing currently on this topic. And I, you know, literally cold call them and invite them, uh, you know, formally invite them to um, provide the professional courtesy of, of uh, a uh, peer review. And <clears throat> the response has been, Tremendous. Nice. I mean, it's not a huge volume. Yeah. This is a very specialized journal and a very narrow niche. But, but the response I've only I, I I think I've had one or two non responses, and one denial because he already said I've already got three or four manuscripts here on my desk that I have to have reviewed before the end of the month. I can't, in good conscience, take on another one at this point. Uh, but but in without exception, those that have responded have always. Um, been very supportive, very intrigued, very encouraging, you know, and and uh, the you know provided a very objective, rigorous review uh, based on the evidence that's presented. Now, not all the reviews go flying through, 
I mean, I try to obviously work with the authors a bit before we send it out for external review to, so they can put their very best foot forward. But um, um, sometimes, you know, the authors are un unwilling to address the, the suggested revisions or uh, things that need further attention. Uh, but in the most cases, it's been a very positive. So that, that allows me to work behind the scenes mm -hmm. in addition to uh, uh, establish, you know, communication and networking with, with the um, members of the editorial board, which span quite a, a spectrum. They're not all anthropologists yeah. I mean, because the types of data that are being analyzed span, you know, into electronics and, uh, and uh, um, folklore and, and so forth. So we have other people with interests, interesting professional credentials, both academic and non-academic credentials that uh, uh, make make very significant contributions. So it's it's a it's a great system so far. Well, if you need any backpacking, if anyone tries to publish anything yeah. backpacking related, you need some reviewers. <laughs> you can send it to Andy or Andy and I. Are, I, I had a really random question. So. Um, I was, cause I was asking some people, I was telling some people, some close friends you were coming on and I was like, do you have any questions? And one was, um, this is cause this is something I'm into, but have you ever thought about using drones to look for oh, the, yeah. yeah. I mean, from, from back when it was not nearly as practical. Yeah. 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 Right. 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 Problem. Uh, yeah. I get accosted <clears throat> on this topic. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? No, I mean, because of the history. Yeah. Early on, I was uh, approached by a gentleman named William Barnes, who had this, he, he had had an experience, had an encounter in uh, California and uh, at, a, at a mining site. He was a, a you know, gold prospector. And, and um, a, as a result, he was a smart guy who, who, who uh, got into the, uh, you know, into the Internet and did research and found contacts and talked to engineers and so forth. And uh, he settled on uh, a drone, and, and particularly a lighter-than-air ship, mm -hmm. uh, as the only practical approach to try to solve this question. Yeah. And but he was a bit ahead of his time <laughs> in that respect, I guess, because yes, there were a few uh, uh, companies out there that were doing some really high-end, uh, you know, blimp-style lighter-than-air ships, but he got hooked up with someone who. Uh, you know, it was, it was a bit of a pie in the sky. It was mm -hmm. overly ambitious. And uh, anyway, it's a long story. But then the recession hit. This was back before the, the recent Great Recession. And, oh, okay. And, uh, and so he had, when he approached me, uh, I mean, it was like, you know, I wasn't going to look a gift horse too closely in the mouth because he had in his back pocket two philanthropists who were going to finance, bankroll the entire Oh, wow. Office. Then the recession hit, and of course, you know, one's portfolio evaporated, and mm -hmm. the other was going to uh, um, sell a significant chunk of real estate and carve off part of the proceeds towards this project. And then, of course, the sale, the real estate uh, you know, <coughs> uh, dried up. So anyway, it languished, and any efforts at fundraising, and we even had some professional fundraisers that did... Um, GoFundMe uh, uh, um, initiatives professionally, and they offered their services pro bono. And uh, he, they said, "This is slam dunk. We'll we'll have you. We'll meet your goal in two weeks." Well, six months later, <laughs> and only, only eight people had <laughs> nominations, and it was just a total rejection of the whole prospect. I think it was in part sticker shock. And uh, there were people who just, you know, didn't get behind it. Why, why should I pay for you to do research when I could go out and, you know, do something? And anyway. Yeah, I would think I, you, you send a couple people up there with the drones. Like, I've got one of these drones. You send a couple people deep into the woods with these things. I mean, you could cover, like 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 you, a, can, you can observe 40 or 50 square miles, like, pretty easily with these things. And I always thought, you know, you could just grab the footage just yeah. and then just you could examine it later and see if you found anything um but like a super easy way to look at a lot of area exactly and and you would think so and i and i and, and like i said i've not kept my my finger entirely on the pulse up to date of what is available i've seen a few things but the problems that we were running into and, and we actually um uh 
John Bindernagel and I were invited to participate in a documentary that was shot <clears throat> up in central British Columbia, and it featured some uh, consulting by professionals with drones there in Canada. And um, and I posed a lot of these questions to them, and, and it's just with time and time again, you know, it, it revealed that while, yeah, it seems like you should be able to do this and that and the other, uh, what we immediately found out was that the quality of the infrared cameras that they had were essentially useless uh, during the daytime and in the early evening hours. Mm. The only time it worked was in the wee hours of the morning. Okay. It, it cooled off. And then as oh, soon as the sun so you could see like a heat signature. Yeah. yeah. You could just see the trees warm up from the crowns down as the sun came up. But only then could you really differentiate a body. And then you, your penetrance through the canopy was very mm -hmm. limited. Mm -hmm. So if you stepped think up about and that. Hugged, hugged a tree trunk, you were invisible. Okay. Went running out. But they actually, as we, just so they could get a good, you know, what if scenario while we were monitoring one of the flyovers, because we, the first day it was total wash. Yeah. So we decided to wrap it up, go home, have an early dinner, go to bed, get up at like three in the morning, go out to the site. And then get the drones up before sunup. <clears throat> and then, boom, you could see what they did is they sent one of the one of the uh, grips, uh, uh, the crew members out, uh, unbeknownst to us. So we're watching this dr overflight. And all of a sudden, this bipedal figure goes running. <laughs> and it's like, oh, what's that? And the key like, grip. That's <laughs> what it was. But then he just showed up you know, very starkly. Uh, but then again, this drone that they were using had about an 18 minute battery life. Yeah, yeah. that's a problem. Yeah. And they had you, so you could send it out, but you you had to maintain a buffer because you couldn't afford right. to, to underestimate the battery life or overestimate and have this thing conk out and drop 150. Mm -hmm. So you had to you know have it back in your hand while it still had about four or five percent at least. Yeah. 10% of battery life. So basically you had five minutes out, maybe, oh, eight minutes flying. And they were, they, they were able to program a pattern, but you know, they couldn't go out 40 square miles. Yeah. And then it had to be back and in your hand before the battery died. So I, m my conclusion was these things are great for reactionary yeah. investigations. You get a report of a sighting or fresh footprint finds, you go out there and you send off these drones and you, you know, you can cover much more area mm -hmm. than you could ever cover on foot. Yeah. As far as systematic survey, cold, you know, you go into a possible habitat area and with no immediate evidence to indicate that there might be a Sasquatch in the area and decide you're just going to do a systematic grid search. I think, you know, it's, it's a, the moving needle in it. Yeah, it's, it'd be like trying to find literally like a needle in it. Yeah, I know. But I always thought that'd be like, you know, interesting use of them. Yeah. I didn't think about the fact that you would, you'd probably want like infrared and then everything heats up naturally. Yeah, because like the with just a regular video camera, the canopy's so thick, it'd be almost impossible to look down into it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm told, I'm told there's military grade. That I'm sure. Oh, you got to you gotta sure. get them involved. <laughs> yeah. And we, we've had, I've had conversations with one gentleman who claims he has access to that and we've uh, you know so we've toyed with the possibility of building a uh, uh, an expedition of sorts a, a study around the uh, potential of him actually getting permission to use some of this mm. tech in the field um, military grade tech but so far we haven't uh, been able to pull all, all the loose ends together yet with the COVID and everything else that has come along but anyway uh, yeah I was, uh, there's a live chat going right now and people are commenting and stuff. And we generally, when, when we talk with people, we generally don't look at the chat, but I, there was one interesting question that came up in there that I figured was probably worth talk asking. Cause we, I, I don't know, we've never really talked about this and it was, it was a question sent around, uh, like evidence. Is there, has there been any evidence or research done on potential, potential like migratory patterns of Sasquatch? Right. There have been individuals who have laid claim. <laughs> Uh, or suggested to me that they had evidence of migratory patterns and uh, and we should make a distinction because sometimes people aren't precise in their mm -hmm. terminology but 
if we're talking about migratory patterns like butterflies flying you know down to central america or birds migratory routes or caribou you know mm -hmm. striking mm -hmm. across the tundra for thousands of miles i think that there's no evidence at all for that kind of a migration mm -hmm. as far as seasonal movements uh through the you know from uh you know altitudinal or right. elevational better word i guess to say elevational um or just um, uh, sort of periodic movements uh, on a longer term basis through an extended habitat seems mm. uh, there seems to be some evidence. So, for example, in some of with some of our interactions with the Eastern Shoshone, they make the comment that they'll be gone sometimes. It seems for up to two years, they don't have any whisper of their presence. And then all of a sudden they're back. So they they some individual and it depends on the individual. Some that are more uh, biologically minded argue or, or uh, suggest that that they are moving through a very large habitat. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are very rare creatures. So we may be talking when I say they. It may be a female and a couple of offspring and a male that's not even directly associated with that group. But they as resources become available. Um, or as they deplete resources in a given area, you know, pick all the morals or right. uh, morels. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, don't want to lose the morals, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, off they go. And then by the time a couple of years have transpired, they're back where this witness frequents the out of doors mm -hmm. and they see some sign. So that's one possibility. There was uh, one, of, uh, <clears throat> one of the fellows who wrote the paper that I cite about the remarkable correlation between black bear habitat and potential Sasquatch distribution, Peter Anello, did his senior honors thesis at the University of Colorado on um, uh, altitudinal or, or uh, let's see, how do you call it, geospatial uh, analysis of the distribution of Sasquatch reports in the Pacific Northwest over a 20 year period. And what he tried to demonstrate, his null hypothesis was that, <clears throat> excuse me, or his, his alternate hypothesis, the null hypothesis would be there's no movement. His mm -hmm. alternate hypothesis would be that there was a, a re reaction by Sasquatch seasonally and to the growth of the metropolitan, greater metropolitan area in around Seattle and Tacoma and uh, Portland and Vancouver. And so he you know, used the various algorithms that these uh, GIS technicians use and demonstrated a very positive relationship that seasonally there was an altitudinal shift in reports. And, and that's a little challenging because you, know, you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt because the data is dependent on on non-scientists getting out there recreating mm -hmm. in the winter, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, people get around a lot with uh, telemark skiing and snowmobiling and whatnot. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, but also more more demonstrable was the impact of the of the uh, growth of the suburban and urban areas seemed to cause the concentrations of reports to shift southerly away from Seattle, Tacoma, you know, and, and further north or further to higher al uh, elevations. And, but also then in Oregon, they seem to be displaced further south in relationship to the greater uh, metropolitan Portland area. Got an A plus on his paper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good the, question. You know, the ideal job at the G at the Esri Center, the, you know, the home, uh, castle of uh, GIS and geographic information systems. So he's been a, he's been an excellent, he's published a couple of interesting papers again in the RHI yeah. a subset of that study, which focused in this case on the um, Walla Walla area, the blue mountains outside of Walla Walla and showed some remarkable correlations there that again, his conclusion was, you know, th this is real data. Mm -hmm. This is not just haphazard. It has a, it has a, a an ecological uh, 
habitat-based rationality to it. And uh, it's a real, real interesting read. That's a good question. Um, sir, we've gone over, but that's because you're, oh, well, you're a great person to talk to, but yes. I, I don't want to steal too much of your time. But I, I really do appreciate the time. This was like very fascinating. Um, if anyone wants to read more about Dr. Meldrum and his research, there's a link to his book in the description. And also I'll put a link to the journal um, for some citizen science action we can do. But, uh, sir, thank you so much. Um, awesome to talk to you. Yeah. We're super interested in this and we, we love hearing, you know, the scientific angle and, uh, you can get your, you can check your community outreach box, uh, for the semester by talking to us. <laughs> um, but, uh, we really do appreciate it and, um, we will, we'll be in contact. I'm sure. You bet. All right. All right. Thank you.